Thanks, Judy. Pleasure. Um, today's reading is Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. And this was written um, 700 years before Christ was born. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders. Oh, this, we've got a different one. Sorry. Ted. Keep going, keep going. Yep. Sounds good. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'll start again. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. Was that the wrong one? That'll do it. That'll do it, Judy. Well, I'm sorry. You read the wrong reading beautifully. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> you're, still, you're still on the prayer list. Don't worry. <laughs> well, I, I, I think Graham has warned us the fact that uh, we're, we're going through a very intensive season and uh, we're all busy running around doing different, different things. But however, uh, comes uh, after Christmas and uh, we start to relax a little bit. Some of you are going on holidays and there you'll be lying on the uh, lilo in the pool sort of gazing up at the sun thinking to yourself, oh, this is blessed, this is absolutely wonderful. I love peace. Or I like you to think of winter. And do you remember those times when you sit beside the gas fire and uh, you're watching a thing on TV then you run like crazy to get in bed, get stripped and uh, get pyjamas on very quickly and jump into bed because the uh, bl electric blanket's on channel three and it's a beautiful warm feeling. <laughs> ah, that beautiful, beautiful peace. Or do you remember when you had young children and uh, that time when you uh, put them to bed and you had a little reading and prayer with them and then they went to sleep. Beautiful yes. peace. The time is over. Now, isn't it true that times we find ourselves saying, when the words of that song, stop the world, I want to get off. Uh, we just get tired of being confronted with the realities and ugliness of the world. And I, I was reading of a, a nun, I've forgotten the name of the book, but she was a nun in a British convent and she... During 1941, she became aware of the war between Britain and Germany at that time. She became aware of the war for the first time when she saw two planes circling overhead having a dogfight. And at that time, she was completely shielded from the world. And some of us would feel that that would be very, very great. You think of the Amish in the United States, in Pennsylvania and other areas, where they preserve the practices of the 18th and 19th century and they form, if you like, a wall around themselves so that the world can go crazy but they will just plot on doing exactly what they are doing. Uh, Ernest Gordon was a Presbyterian minister who became a prisoner uh, during the Second World War and uh, he wrote a book, Miracle on the River Choir. I don't know how many of you read that. A great book. But he talks about the fact that at one stage the group of prisoners, emaciated, thin, fading away, looking like their death warmed up. And beside them was a group of Buddhist priests on their last stage to Nirvana. And they walked by without caring, sparing a glance towards the emaciated prisoners. And they were shielded from the world. Wouldn't it be great to be like that? But that is not the expectation. Blessed are the peacemakers, says Jesus, not the peaceful. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Now, when you uh, think of that uh, Hebrew word shalom, which means peace, and it's a favourite greeting amongst Jew Jewish people, shalom, they mean peace for you, but they also mean peace for others. And when we think of that, we think of Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. How can we become a peacemaker? Now, here's where my leanings come through a little bit. When, when Jesus said it, he said uh, he's appoint, been appointed to uh, 
bring good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed and announce that the time has come that the Lord will save his people. And what shalom means and what Jesus means is being peaceful is not just about us, but is bringing peace for the sake of others. And it causes us to reflect on what we're doing. And we start to see that being godly is building a better world. Being godly, being blessed, is being involved in the art of reconciliation. Blessed are those who bring healing. Blessed are those who put their lives on the line in order to bring people together. I was age 17 and uh, I was at a football match between South Melbourne and this is where I lose the friendship of two people in the congregation <laughs> and Collingwood. <laughs> and of course you could imagine that, uh, what it was like. You know, the South Melbourne people got bashed up and we're walking out, the whole crowd of us <laughs> walk, walking out and there's this guy in the Collingwood jumper and he said, you South Melbourne supporters, you're all crazy. And of course a little fight started between the South Melbourne supporter and the Collingwood barricade. And I thought, I'm going to be a peacemaker. Right? And I stepped in between them. Big mistake. Next thing I was on the ground with a very bruised ear. And I never forgive that guy for what he did to me. Now, you should learn from that experience that being a peacemaker means that there's going to be cost involved. And when Jesus read out that text that we just had read to us about uh, how he was uh, going to help people, he was going to bless them and all that type of thing, we read Luke 4, he was run out of town because of that. They were going to stone him because of what he said. Now, some of us have got an idea, I've met a lot of people who've got an idea, that Christianity is being a mystic. Christianity is being a cloud nine just watching the world go by like that nun in the combat unaware of the fight that was going on over her head. Well, get it out of your mind because that is not what Jesus is saying. Blessed are the peacemakers. And peacemakers can be, if you like, controversial, as we've discovered with those examples we've looked at. Now, what can we do? The first thing I would say is we should not be a war glorifier. You visited uh, cathedrals in England and there's one thing that upsets me when I go into cathedrals in England. I I'm bit of, get upset at the opulence and the great big buildings that nobody uses except for tourists. But also as you walk through these buildings you'll see army colours and you'll see the army being glorified in a Christian context. I, I don't like that. I'm, I'm a bit of a pacifist when you scratch pretty deeply about it. And when you think of the, uh, the way that we've glorified war, and sometimes we're inclined to do that on an Anzac day, you think of the suffering that occurs because of it. Now, we're talking about Gaza at the moment. And uh, when you talk about Gaza, you think of, uh, well, what happened? 12, 13, 1400 Jews were killed in a, sometime, in a very brutal way. Reaction, anger, revenge is causing the death of something like 15,000 people. And you see that that is a pattern that, that happens. Now, you watch, do you remember the film Saving Private Ryan? Yeah. The first 20 minutes is devoted to the Americans coming ashore at Omaha Beach. And you see the slaughter. And they tell me it was very, very real. Spielberg really ca captured the moment. And we see the slaughter that occurs and we see the, the grief that would be associated with that with every family back at home. Or you think of the Somme uh, during the First World War when British troops were trained and German troops were also trained just to charge machine guns, which is not a very good thing for your health. Well, Mar Marge and I have been to Hiroshima and some of you have too. And you see the bomb that was the results of the bomb that was dropped. And you walk through the, the peace memorial there and you're quite disturbed by it. And you think that war is a horrible thing. Now, Eisenhower, who was himself a general uh, of the uh, United States and also a former president, listen to what he said. Every gun that is made... Every warship that is launched, every rocket that is fired, signifies a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, 
and those who are cold and not clothed. Now, thinking of the war in Gaza, and Graham told us that uh, we can, there are various ways we can give. If we give, it is a small act of being a peacemaker. It is a very small act of being a peacemaker. And it might be that we would lessen the resentment that would be being found in a very strong way in that area at the moment. We're not about anti-Jew, we're not about pro-Palestine or anything like that. We are, if you like, trying to be peacemakers. And I'm quite pleased to announce that already that four or five people in the leadership group have almost given $2,000 themselves and uh, we're target is 4000 and we're halfway there. It's a good start. And I would urge you to get your copy of the church paper and to read about how you can give as well. And I, I think of what's happened there. And I wonder if war has accumulated because the Palestinians have not been treated well for centuries. And if they had been treated well, where the Hamas would actually exist. I, that's, that's a thought I have and you can tell me about it afterwards. But Pearl, Pearl Harbour, we celebrated the anniversary this week. And uh, what, uh, 2,500 sailors were killed in that war, in that invasion. And then from that, millions of people lost their lives, all out of proportion. You think of the First World War, uh, where a, the Archduke of uh, Ferdinand was uh, slaughtered by a, a Serbian rebel. One bullet cost millions of lives when you think about it. And you think about how crazy anger and revenge is. You think of Poland, when Germany invaded there in 1939, Thousands of people lost their lives in a horrific event. Any Polish person could tell you that. But then you think of the millions of lives who lost their millions of lives cost because of that invasion. It's all out of proportion. And I guess that's one reason why I'm a bit of a pacifist when you scratch deeply. Esther Orsberger, she was a Mennonite. Mennonites were pacifists and she was upset about the fact that there was so much war going on. And she decided there was an uh, amnesty conducted in Washington, D.C., where the mayor organised the fact that guns would be return, could be returned, you wouldn't be fined for having an illegal gun, and uh, they were going to melt it down and use it for trains or something like that. Esther Orsberger became involved, and she said, can I have the results of the meltdown and I'm going to build a sculpture. And it was a sculpture. It was very hard to understand what it was about. It was a ploughshare. And that ploughshare, when it was erected outside the Mennonite University, it reflected this verse. They shall beat their swords into ploughshares and their spears into pruning hooks. So they shall beat their swords into ploughheads and the nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Now, she copped a lot of flack because of that, but she was endeavouring to be a peacemaker. Let's not glorify war. And also, let's become a peacemaker in terms of our relationships with each other. Can you remember family life? Or do you watch your own children bringing up their kids? And isn't it true that family life can be like a washing machine. Oh. And some of you have experienced that very, very recently. And in, when you're involved in that, you ask yourself, how can I be a peacemaker? And one of the things that uh, I learned from a very long process of, in terms of pastoral work was learning to enter the world of your wife and learning to enter the world of your children. And when you see the battle of independence, when the toddler throws a fit uh, in the uh, supermarket because she wants a chocolate, uh, you realise it's a battle of independence. When the teenager objects to the fact that you're worried about the length of her skirt and what time she's coming home after a uh, party, you're battling with the battle of independence. And if we could enter our world, we might just lessen the conflict that occurs. And uh, I had to learn, when your wife has two or three jobs, they're under stress. The children in an adult body can cause a lot of stress as well. 
And when you're going through that stage, you find the husband is often under a lot of stress because he's worried about promotion or the income or something like that. But we can justify our hurt feelings and blame it on everybody else. But when we enter the world of the other person, we become, if you like, a peacemaker. The other thing about the steps towards becoming a peacemaker is that our faith can actually help in this process. Over the last few weeks, you've heard a lot about anger, you've heard a lot about conflict, you've heard a lot about stress, you've heard a lot about worry. And each time we accumulate a little bit of that in our lives, when the continual nagging from the pulpit to be a person who reduces anger and reduces animosity, when you hear that and you take it on board, you are dealing, if you like, with other people in a much more positive way and you're on the way to becoming a peacemaker. Now, we need to understand, we need to stress this with the, the series on the Beatitudes. This is not an ideal. This is an expectation. Jesus is talking to his disciples, spelling out to them what is involved in becoming a peacemaker. And he's saying to them, each one of us should be involved in some way in doing that. So the steps, don't be a war glorifier. Don't be a person who stirs up trouble in the family and be at peace within yourself. And then the promise, you shall be called children of God. What's that mean? You'll be doing what God expects you to do. Christmas is coming. And Christmas is about being a peacemaker. When you stand back and look at it, Christmas is all about reconciliation. And I'll be saying more about this in a couple of weeks. But when you look at the Old Testament, you don't find that they've got a clear understanding of what God is like. And when Christ comes and comes into our world and he reveals what God wants us, we understand more of what God is like. If you like, it's, Christmas is about Trinity. Christmas is about God revealing what he wants. And he introduces us to a new understanding of God and he wants us to be agents of reconciliation. Instead of being a warrior god, he becomes the prince of peace. Now, when we start thinking about this, we start thinking about the church, and we start thinking about what the church should be doing. And uh, I, I can think of uh, what I heard this week of two churches in a regional area. Uh, one church was involved, if you like, in prayer, Bible study, keeping women out of the pulpit. It was a pretty conservative church. The other church was involved in, if you like, social action. And it seemed to me that there was this one or the other. And when we look at those people, we discover that John Wesley's in the picture and as well as Nelson Mandela. Completely different people, but working on slightly different agendas. And I believe they should be both. I believe in the life of the church we should bring both together. My Marge, when she was doing her theology degree, did an essay, and uh, I read it through, and it was a very, very good essay. You got an A for it, I think, uh, on uh, Billy Graham and Martin, Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King, strong about bringing people together, Afro-American and whites. Billy Graham, strong about bringing people together in reconciliation between God and man. And both need to be a part of the agenda of the church. And when they are not both there, the church becomes lopsided. And I see a lot of lopsided churches and I trust that we will not become one. Whatever it is, peacemaking is about bringing people to God and also about bringing people a form of peace uh, as well. So, what are we going to do? Have a think about your emotional habits, whether they are destructive. Do something, even if it's small, about reducing international uh, intention. And if you know someone who's estranged from God, do something about helping them find God. And whatever you're going to do, do it, do it very, very soon. In order to be a peacemaker, we do both things. We encourage them to find God 
and to find peace in their world as well. As we come to communion, I'm going to talk to you or read to you a passage about the reconciling God. The God who came in Jesus Christ at Christmas time to bring the world and God together. A beautiful passage from Colossians. Listen to it. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers. All things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things and in all things hold him, in him hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead, so that he might have first place in everything. For in him the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him, listen to this, God was pleased to reconcile all things to himself, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his Christ of the cross. Christ, the ultimate peacemaker. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Father, we want to thank you for this communion time. We want to thank you that it reminds us that you are the God who has reconciled us to himself. And we also thank you for the tremendous price that was paid. Help us to understand this. Help us to absorb it that we too might become peacemakers according to your will. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. The total congregation is invited to come, take the bread and the cup and to remember Christ. Whether you're not used to working with, worshipping with us, you're still welcome to come and share the bread and cup. Come in Christ's name.